right, Sonny Jim. You can listen to me. You are making some serious PC gaming mistakes right now, and they are hampering your PC gaming experience. Whether it's game load times issues, reduced FPS, or just not properly updating your in-game settings, there are so many different ways you can improve your gaming PC without any real effort. And that is exactly why, in this very video, we're going to be going through all of the simple mistakes that you're probably making around your gaming PC, as well as their solutions. And we're going to break all of this down into three main categories. Choosing and building your gaming PC, setting up your computer, and then actually running the games themselves. And I'll tell you what, no matter how advanced you think you are at PC gaming, I can almost guarantee that you would have made at least one of these PC gaming mistakes. So stay tuned to make your gaming experience that little bit better, right after a short word from this video's sponsor. Corsair's brand new 2500 series of cases has arrived, proving serious airflow can come in small sizes. This MATX enclosure fits huge graphics cards and coolers, and thanks to its dual chamber design, building is a breeze. I've even equipped mine with Corsair's new IQ RX fans, which comes with new magnetic dome bearings for quieter acoustics, and Corsair's air guide technology for more directed airflow. Learn more today with the link down below. Rightio then, let's begin. When choosing PC parts, what do people get wrong? Well, I think it's fair to say that the single biggest mistake that people make at this stage is not prioritizing the graphics card above all else. Because the graphics card, or GPU for short, is the single most important piece of any gaming computer, and almost every game will use this flat out, with the game's frame rate, resolution, and settings determined by how much you actually spend on the graphics card in the first place. But don't go thinking that this is a video all about choosing the perfect graphics card, because it's not. I've already made this video a couple of months ago. You can find it in the top right corner of your screen. Instead, I first want to talk about something I'm seeing more and more, which is people that are saving up for a gaming PC and then buying their components one by one. Please don't do this. Gaming PC parts come in cycles, as every year or two, newer and better components arrive that are more powerful than the ones that they replace. And for better or worse, buying components over the space of six to eight months means that chances are something newer will land before you're done building, meaning you could have had something even better or get the same, now older product for less. For the avoidance of doubt, I'd usually recommend buying PC parts over the span of a couple of days, maybe a week rather than months. But there is actually an exception to this rule, which is also a PC mistake, and that is to not look at PC sales and perhaps be a little bit inflexible about your purchases. There's loads of good PC parts, you don't specifically need one thing in particular, especially if it's cheaper. Honestly, do even the slightest bit of research and you'll find that there are always great sales on PC components pretty much everywhere you look, but they do change so quickly that it is pretty difficult to keep up with them all. Intel Arc GPUs, for one, are regularly discounted, flip-flopping them between maybe worth buying and an absolute steal, while sales from Amazon, Newegg, and Best Buy are always rotating, so getting an SSD from a slightly different brand, or maybe a case with a different look, it really could save you a ton of cash. Another great way to save yourself on the upfront cost of a gaming PC is to cut a few corners, and the main two really that I'd recommend would be to get yourself a less expensive motherboard, and to actually save yourself a bit on the CPU cooler. You'd be surprised just how many people send me spec sheets with 500 pound motherboards and $300 CPU coolers. And honestly guys, why? What are you actually gaining here? Don't tell me it's for longevity. You're just likely being missold on what it actually is that you need. I'd instead recommend that you have a look at the TDP of your processor and then find a suitable cooler that costs under 100 pounds of dollars and pick a B-series motherboard with some respectable reviews, support for Wi-Fi and ideally USB flashing, unless of course there's something specific that you actually need. I'd also recommend against front mounting an all-in-one radiator, as this then just pumps hot air straight into your graphics card, which will then ramp up the fans and make your system unnecessarily louder. Something else I've noticed as of late is people under-specking their SSD, and I'm not suggesting everyone goes out and buys an upside down super expensive Samsung 990 Pro, but you should be careful about what it is that you buy, especially when it comes to capacity. Seriously folks, games are getting bigger and bigger. It's now normal for a AAA title to take a whopping 125 gigabytes of storage space, and if you're like me, you like to chop and change what it is that you play, so you need a bigger capacity SSD that will actually let you play more games at the same time. 
I mean, obviously not literally at the same time. Don't be pedantic with me now. And don't forget, of course, that because these games are so big, if you do delete them and reinstall, it's going to take an absolute age on the average internet connection. The raw speed of your SSD is also something that's very easy to overlook. You might be thinking that one terabyte is one terabyte, right? But you'd be wrong. It's also worth reading the specifications to see what's better. Just be aware that the more expensive ones require more cash. I'll see myself out. The TLDR too long didn't read is generally speaking, look for an SSD that's around about 3000 megabytes or higher on both the reads and the writes. And that should be enough for most PC gamers for the foreseeable future. The final piece of advice that I'll give for our part selection is actually for Nvidia fans. And it's to try and get a power supply that comes with a 12 volt high power cable as standard, as this will allow your build to look so much neater and it won't rely on that horrible, ugly Nvidia adapter that comes with your GPU. Oh, but look, another PC-centric video. All he's doing is talking about PC parts. This isn't relevant to me. This is a crap video. Dislike. Never watching this again. How about, calm down, mate. Just give us a second, and we can move on to the next section of this video, which is, of course, setting up and actually optimizing your gaming PC. And I'd strongly argue that the biggest mistakes you can make for gaming performance actually start in the BIOS, with the main one being not turning on XMP or AMD Expo within the BIOS itself. This setting actually sets your RAM to its full rated speed through overclocking, and lets your gaming PC achieve faster frame rates, especially when you're limited by your processor. You also want to make sure that you turn on resizable bar, especially if you're rocking an older system where it's not on by default. Ah, oh, and this also brings me on to probably my most annoying thing that people miss with their gaming PCs, which is not tuning your fans. And this is usually done in the BIOS, but generally speaking, you know whether you've done it or not, because you can stand next to it and it's kind of this quiet. If it's making any noise when your PC's not working, then you haven't tuned your fans properly. And the way to set this up is pretty straightforward. If you're using like a normal motherboard without any like third party hubs like from Corsair or anything like that, then you make sure you plug everything into the motherboard, you go into the BIOS, and then there'll be a fan tuning utility and either automatically or manually, you can set all the different fan speeds to only ramp up when your PC is actually doing anything. Because having all your fans run at like 50% when the CPU is at 30 degrees in the desktop, literally doing nothing is just literally a waste of noise. It annoys me so much. Please don't do it. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that this next mistake is gonna rile some of you up. That's okay, everyone. Let's raise the energy, let's be riled, let's shout at the screen. It's okay, I'm not gonna hear you. Anyway, that is to actually upgrade, if you haven't already, your PC from Windows 10 to Windows 11. Oh, that's it, I, I can't believe you said that, that's it unsubscribe. Chill out. It's okay. Allow me to explain. I was actually using Windows 10 on my own PC. I didn't want to upgrade it. I left it for ages. There, there are some improvements to Windows 11. It's really annoying that you've got to have a Microsoft account and a few different things like that. But performance generally I think is a bit better. It's a bit snappier just in general use. But in particular, if you have an Intel CPU or at least a newer Intel CPU that has the combination of efficiency cores and performance cores, so anything 12th gen and up, there should be some under the hood performance improvements there that will actually make your PC run better. Not a guarantee, but it's certainly something that might help. But then the main one really for me is that if you're an HDR gamer, so you have an HDR TV or an HDR monitor, then the performance difference is ridiculous. Basically with Windows 11, it works properly. With Windows 10, in my experience, it really doesn't. So if you have an HDR monitor and you've had like bad experiences getting games to display properly, try upgrading to Windows 11 if you're comfortable doing that because the experience I'm telling you is much, much better. Is that okay? Pitchforks down, I'm going now. Regardless of which operating system you do decide to use though, please make sure your screen is actually running at the full refresh rates. It is incredibly easy to check. Just hit display settings and then find the option for a refresh rate, then just pick the fastest number available. And I know, well, I know this is super obvious, but actually something that catches a lot of people out is that when you install a graphics driver, or more importantly, when you update a graphics driver, it can actually default back to the 60 hertz you were on originally. And if you don't check this very often, or maybe you've just been like using your PC normally and playing a game like a week later or something like that, this could, as I say, have caught you out. So have a little check. And if it's helped, you're welcome. I tell you what, I feel like I'm running at 60 hertz. Let's boost me to 120 now as we actually move on to the adjoining topic of driver updates. Everyone's favorite, hooray. 
There better have been some good FX there, Carl. Is there anything left in the budget, Carl? Can we make this funnier somehow? And I know, I know, a driver update is really tedious, it takes a lot of time, but honestly, it is super important because the graphics card driver is essentially the secret source that lets your hardware get properly used in-game. And it will have a ginormous impact on your FPS, especially if the title has just been released. I advise running NVIDIA's GeForce Experience or enable the AMD and Intel driver update tools to tell you when there's a new driver update available, as this will do all of the work for you, and that way you'll always be getting the best FPS possible. If you're running on a gaming laptop, also ensure that you're in the high performance modes in your vendor's management tools, as this is the only way to ensure you're sending every drop of power to your laptop's CPU and GPU. And of course, don't forget to plug in. And I know you're gonna say that this next one is incredibly boring, but a big PC mistake that loads of people make is to not actually monitor the temperatures of what's in your PC. I'm not saying you need to do it every five seconds, but downloading something like Core Temp or some form of CPU monitoring tool is really gonna help your PC's longevity. There are loads of great free tools available. As I say, I use Core Temp for my PC, but if you're already using something like Corsair's IQ, Intel XT Cam, anything like that, that's perfectly fine. You can also set up alerts in these tools too, so if your temp, say, hit over 90 degrees, then you can get a notification pop up to actually tell you. And I know it's more of a tip than a mistake, but if you haven't already, be sure to hit Windows, Shift and Escape right now whilst you're watching this, and then make sure Always on Top is selected, as this will save you from restarting your PC if you experience a game crash. And speaking of games, let's talk about games. And I'll tell you what guys, I'll do you a proper solid here. If you want the easiest one-click optimization for video game settings so you never need to think about it ever again, then just hit optimize or optimize all in your GeForce Experience or AMD panel and then it will automatically match the settings to your PC specifications automatically so you don't need to think about it ever again. But many of you are going to be like me and we're going to be stubborn purists and we say no to that. This is my PC. I want to do what I want. But then we're going to make the biggest mistake arguably of all of these, which is playing every game at ultra settings just because it sounds good. Why, why do we do this? Well, you're probably saying, Mr. PC centric, it's because I've spent all of this money on a gaming PC and ultra's the best. That's what I want. But let's be honest, can you actually notice a difference versus high? Probably not. But the boost to FPS? Yeah, you certainly can. And in a way, we're almost going backwards as we've now got settings like ray tracing, which is actually a great example of something that you should definitely turn off first and then check your frame rate. And if you're getting around about 80 frames a second or higher, turn it on, but slowly but surely. Please don't forget that the way a game actually feels is far more important than those fancy rays. Ray Charles? Ray Stubbs? Blue Ray? Cosmic Ray? Stingray? That's enough rays. On the flip side, I hear so many people in the comment section that are resistant to using DLSS Super Resolution, which, if you're not aware, is NVIDIA's upscaling tech that makes your games look almost as good as native resolution, but with loads extra FPS. And if I'm honest, I don't really understand why people are so against this. I do think it is a vocal minority, but I genuinely believe that this is probably the best technology that we've had in the last few years. Better than frame generation, better than ray tracing, because it actually means everyone that uses these cards does actually get a better level of performance. And you can feel this when you're playing the game. Maybe it's because people are basing this on AIM is competing FSR, which especially the early versions was not good. Whatever the reason, DLSS is great. It can give you a better boost to your FPS than loads of other settings combined. So if you haven't tried it or you're resistant to it, try it again, see what you think and go from there. Or should I go live in a hole and never talk about computers ever again? To the naysayers credit, however, it does get a little bit more complex and confusing when we're talking about DLSS frame generation though, as this is almost the opposite situation and it's actually the setting I would probably turn on last, even after ray tracing. You see, frame generation uses AI to add in these fake frames between rendered ones and it can make your game look way smoother on screen as a result. However, it does have a serious latency penalty and as such I would only advise turning this on if you're already getting around about 60 frames a second. It's not something to fix a lowly 30 or 40 as it'll just make your game laggy and horrible. To properly test this I would advise using Nvidia's frame view tool and then looking at the latency figure aiming for around about 55 milliseconds or lower if you're playing a single player game. 
If you're playing a multiplayer game, then always turn this setting off, as you don't want any extra latency, even if it's smoother. You should also pay very close attention to the V-Sync setting, and this should, generally speaking, be on if you're over the maximum refresh rate of your monitor. So let's say you're getting 200 frames a second in a single-player game, and your monitor caps out at 144. You want to turn this on. Whereas if you're playing a multiplayer game, or maybe you're getting 44 frames a second and your monitor refreshes at 60, turning it off will once again reduce the latency. You might get a little bit of tearing, where the sort of frames like are a little bit misaligned, but this is better than having input lag that makes your experience even worse. And then, ladies and gentlemen, this now brings us to what I'd like to call the bonus mistakes that you're not aware that you're making, but probably are. And actually, the first one, again, a little bit more of like a philosophical, personal bit of advice here, and that is to carefully look at the games you play and consider whether you're missing out on loads of other great genres just because you don't really think about trying them out. PC gaming is great because you can get sales and there are so many different ways of accessing games cheaply, especially indie titles that you might not have sort of thought about before. You've got this mouse and keyboard if you've moved from console that you wouldn't have used before. You've got this whole new genre of games to try out. So I'd highly advise to actually try new things rather than just staying in your lane. Just spitballing the obvious ones for a second, maybe it's serious FPS with some Valorant or Counter-Strike, some MOBA with League of Legends or Dota, or of course strategy games like my personal favourite Civilization or Total War. Sure, they might not be for you, but how would you know without trying? And how did I forget Planet Zoo? That game's so good. If you do have a little bit of change rumbling around in your pocket, or you don't mind saving and you want to make an upgrade for your PC setup, then I would always advise that you actually look at upgrading either your gaming monitor or your gaming mouse before anything else. Because when you think about it, these are the things that you actually interact with. I mean, the monitor is everything that you see, so you could have the best PC in the world, but if you're rocking like a 24-inch 1080p 60Hz display, you're not getting the most out of it whatsoever. And also when it comes to the mouse, you'd be surprised just how much they've come on over the last five years or so. And even spending like a modest amount, like 25, 30 pounds, something like that, can really improve your experience, especially if you're using sort of like hand-me-downs from either like a previous non-gaming setup or maybe your friends from the previous generation. It's actually surprisingly good to upgrade these things as these make more of a noticeable difference than maybe like a 15% boost to FPS or something like that. We don't have enough time to go through all of the ins and the outs in this particular video, but I'll be sure to leave some of my personal favourites and recommendations down in the description below. And if you are after a new gaming monitor, then I've actually just made a full guide about everything you need to know. And again, you can find that video in the top right corner of your screen or in the description down below. And actually, I think that is a beautiful place to end this video. Those are some of the top PC mistakes. Did I seriously just mispronounce the word mistake in a video all about mistakes? The irony's not lost on me there. I really hope you've enjoyed this video though. If you have, do consider subscribing so you get more videos just like this straight to your inbox. Smash the like button if you've enjoyed this. And as I say, if you do want to check out current pricing on anything that we've talked about or featured in this video, then you can find everything listed down below with our affiliate links. And while you're down there, why not bask in the greatness of Corsair's 2500 series of cases? This stunning new chassis takes your build to the next level. With support for calling it the top, bottom, rear and side, in addition to showing your PC parts in their best light. You can even pair it with Corsair's new IQ RX fans. For seamless cable management thanks to IQ Link, with awesome acoustic and thermal performance in both RGB and solid flavours. Upgrade today with the link down below. But thank you so much for watching this video, we'll catch you in the next one.